The automobile is the most romantic of all machines. Romantic because it is personal and it delivers people to places they want to go in a style they have come to enjoy, presently and nostalgically. An automobile is a vehicle that must contain a driver, passengers and cargo. It includes a power source, the controls to guide the vehicle and the wheels upon which it rides. Throughout the history of the automobile, the space allotted to these components has changed to accommodate shifts in buyer needs and desires. But where did it all start? We know that a steam-powered vehicle was developed in France as early as 1769, and steam-powered road locomotives became a reality in England around 1800. At about the same time, Americans had fallen in love with the bicycle. There were all kinds, from bicycles built for two or built for ten, to velocipedes with front wheels that went up to five feet in diameter. It was the bicycle that gave most Americans the desire to travel about easily and set the stage for the automobile. It's not surprising then that many of the early auto manufacturers were people from the bicycle industry. The first commercially available automobile was manufactured by Carl Benz and his brother in Germany in 1885. In America, a man named Durier demonstrated his car in 1893, and the following year, he sold three of them. Henry Ford's famous quadricycle, obviously a relative of the bicycle, was built in 1896, and in that same year, Ransom Olds introduced his first gasoline-powered automobile. Contrary to popular belief, neither Olds nor Ford were first with mass production. Durier produced 13 identical automobiles in Springfield, Massachusetts in 1896. Looking back, it's difficult to see why the early automobiles created so much excitement. The first cars were merely platforms with four wheels, a seat, a steering device, and an engine. As it developed, some obvious things had to be done right away. Engines were covered to keep out inquisitive fingers and cut down on noise and fumes. Lights were added to aid in night driving. This was the basic arrangement of the Curve Dash Olds of 1901, the automobile that established Detroit Automotive Center of the U.S. A fire in the Oldsmobile Motor Works destroyed everything but one car, a Curve Dash Olds. In order to stay in business, drawings were made directly from the one remaining car and various parts were subcontracted in Detroit. Most of these subcontractors eventually became automobile manufacturers. About 1904, the first windscreens appeared and most of the automobile bodies of this era had what was called Roy de Bell's coachwork, taken from a vehicle built to the specifications of the King of Belgium. This general body design, sometimes called a tonneau with two seats in front and three at the rear, was retained by the industry for almost 15 years. The entrance to the back seat was from the rear of the car. Originally, most accessories were outside the passenger compartment, under the floor or fastened to the back. Even the brakes and gear shift were outside at first, as well as appropriate boxes for tools or picnic lunches. It's said that in those days, even the mother-in-law rode outside the car. Whether or not this is true, many of the cars sported small seats at the rear called mother-in-law seats. It would be some years before the top, windshield, doors, and basic body would gradually grow together into one piece, but all the pieces necessary for an enclosed automobile were already well developed. By 1909, there were 290 different makes of automobiles produced at 145 cities in 45 states. Talk about competition. Detroit alone had 25 different car makes, and a total of 45 makes were produced in Michigan. Options such as tops, windshields, and lamps became standard equipment. Speedometers, shock absorbers, and sliding transmissions all added to the weight and size of the automobile, which in turn required bigger engines. Cadillac introduced an electric starter developed by Charles F. Kettering along with a generator battery lighting system. The electric starter made it practical for the first time for a woman to own and drive an automobile. 
During the period before the First World War, the basic configuration of the automobile was still somewhat uncertain, and many strange and marvelous variations were attempted. The inventor of the Reeves Octo Auto felt that eight wheels were better than four. Others experimented with size, from the 1911 Olds Limited with 43-inch wheels, the largest production car ever built in the U.S., to the Woods Mobilette. Some tried steam, gasoline, and electricity, and at times even combined them, as in this Woods Gas Electric. This 1915 Saxon illustrates the trend to light cars in this period. Another car, the Gatabout Roadster, offered a wicker body, and the National had an original seating arrangement, four armchairs that could be moved on casters in any direction. About the time of the First World War, most automobiles started to settle down to the general mechanical configuration we know in America today. Designers borrowed from the armored cars and other military vehicles that were produced at the time. Straight lines, higher hoods, and steel wheels gave many of the new models a warlike appearance. Following a short, sharp depression in 1920, things got better and better until they reached a climax in the giddy and glamorous days just before the stock market crash of 1929. The Essex was one of the first new low-price closed cars introduced in the 20s. And the Overland offered a unique body style, three doors. Another closed car, the 1921 Ford sedan, featured a single door on each side, which allowed driver and passenger to enter either the front or back seats from the center door. As the economy improved, luxury cars began to appear in greater numbers. Duesenberg brought out the first straight eight and the first four-wheel hydraulic brakes in the U.S. The Stutz Bearcat was the Playboy's car and one that attracted crowds then, even as now. The General Motors Proving Ground in Milford, Michigan was completed in 1924. Not one electric or steam car was displayed at the National Automobile Show. Top attractions were cars featuring four-wheel brakes and balloon tires as standard equipment. At this time, there was one automobile for every seven people in the U.S. With the increased number of cars came real personal freedom of movement and the much talked about love affair with the motor car. The 25 millionth U.S. motor vehicle was produced in 1925. The new models featured one-piece windshields, mohair upholstery, and crank-type window lifts. Synthetic quick-drying paints that could be sprayed on and baked gave the industry a wide range of high-gloss finishes. For the first time, more clothes than open models were sold. General Motors introduced the LaSalle in 1927. It was the first mass-produced car to be styled by a professional designer directly employed by the manufacturer. At the other end of the price range, Henry Ford brought out his Model A, a dramatic change for Ford automobiles. During this decade, the body became a solid enclosure as windshields, roof, and doors grew together to make the cars more sturdy and more reliable. Up to this time, automobiles used very straightforward bodywork. But gradually, the corners started to round off and compound curves started to appear on fenders and rear corners of the roof and the headlights. This normal evolution, plus the dramatic luxury cars coming into existence, created a consumer demand for automotive styling. More than ever before, the car expressed status, power, fun, glamour, and freedom. The late 20s and early 30s was the era of the flapper, the Newport mansions, yachts, Thompson Trophy races, movie stars, and classic cars. The L29 Cord was introduced in 1929. This front-wheel drive car indicated a new willingness on the part of the manufacturer to tempt the public with new features and new concepts. Duesenberg shocked the automotive world by offering a car with fantastic performance, ranging from 265 horsepower in the J model to 320 horsepower in the SJ series. This car had about the same impact that would result from the introduction of a car today with almost a thousand horsepower. Cadillac's introduction of a V16 in 1930 announced the era of multiple cylinder engines in this country. The 1930 Packard Custom Phaeton, the 1932 KB Lincoln with its V12 engine, and the 1933 Chrysler Imperial LeBaron 
one of the last Chryslers with a solid front axle, are some of the classics of this period. In Europe, designers were building some memories of their own. The Bugatti Royale is one of the most famous classics, even though less than 10 were sold. This Hispano Suiza was built to be driven in the 1924 Take a Floral race. The body is made of tulip wood, and the fenders were added after the race. The supercharged Mercedes SSK and the 1931 Rolls-Royce Phantom II convertible sedan are outstanding examples of some of the European cars of this vintage. The luxury car consumer of the 30s placed more emphasis on performance and overall magnificence than ever before. The pressure of consumer demands spurred the stylist and engineer to further developments in automotive design. The invention of the hypoid rear axle was one of the first moves in lowering the silhouette of the automobile by offsetting the drive shaft below the axle. Knee action or independent front wheel suspension was introduced in 1934. This created a drastic change in the proportions of the automobile. Without the beam axle, the engine could move forward and eventually down between the front wheels. Other changes affected the interior compartment room. In 1931, the Rio Royale started the popular trend to slanted windshields. And in 1936, side windows that sloped in at the top were first seen. In the years between 1935 and 1939, it was discovered that the automobile stylus could drastically change the exterior shape of the American production automobile. The styling of the 810-812 cord with its front wheel drive brought this to the public's attention. The 1936 Lincoln Zephyr with its pointed grille and fastback roof line, and the 1938 Cadillac 60 Special, which eliminated running boards and introduced the use of lightweight convertible window frames, were the forerunners of a remarkable acceleration in the appearance characteristics of the automobile. Over the years, styling and aerodynamics gradually moved the body shell outwards. In the process, the trunk became part of the body shell, and the spare tire moved inside. The headlights flared out, then dissolved into the fender. The hood sheet metal moved out over the radiator, and the fenders elongated, flattened, and gradually became part of the body side. Over this span of time, every major component of the automobile moved inside the body. In 1938, Pontiac moved the gear shift from the floor up onto the steering column to help provide more front foot room and automatic transmissions were offered by Oldsmobile and Buick for the first time. During the war years, we really can't point out too much of a change in automobiles. However, the Jeep became a legend while most of the manufacturers turned to products other than automobiles. Following the war, most consumers eagerly awaited the post-war car. Studebaker was first to bring out a new model. And in 1946, Kaiser Frazier introduced the first car with straight-through body sides, which eliminated fender forms. The most sensational post-war announcement was the Tucker. And although the car never became a reality, the public's appetite for new cars was obvious. The 1948 Hudson offered a new step-down design, which put the passengers not only down between the wheels, but down between the frame members as well. This basic arrangement exists in most of today's automobiles. By 1949, every major manufacturer had eliminated most of the fender forms and had some version of the so-called flush side styling. With the introduction of the four-door hardtop, GM eliminated the center pillar in the side windows and gave the consumer an automobile with the feeling of a convertible and the safety of an all-steel roof. Wartime scarcities created a tremendous desire for new cars and new features. An era of challenge and response was begun. The customers let the producers know what they wanted by posting sales records for vehicles and options they liked. And the manufacturers responded by competing for customer attention. Many of the sales records set in the mid-50s still stand today. The wraparound windshield was one of the features that helped set off a consumer demand for automobiles unequaled in automotive history. The 1960s ushered in an era that saw a trend to small cars, a greater emphasis on automotive safety, and increased concern for the environment. The continuing movement of people to the suburbs and the increase in personal income resulted in the growth of two-car families. 
The preference of many consumers for simple, more economical transportation spurred the sales of small imports until they reached a total of almost one million in 1968. U.S. manufacturers responded by introducing compacts of their own, and automotive engineers and designers had to find new ways to create more room inside the car. In 1962, Buick moved the engine and transmission forward to reduce the hump in the floor, and the Tempest transaxle moved the transmission to the rear of the car. Curved glass made it possible to create thinner doors and increased shoulder room. Safety features added to cars during this decade included dual braking systems, factory installed seat belts, amber lights for front turn signals, and energy absorbing steering columns. In 1963, positive crankcase ventilating systems were installed nationwide on all cars and light trucks, and several years later, exhaust emission control systems became standard equipment on all 1967 makes. 1970 found U.S. automakers in a global automotive battle as Japanese manufacturers were challenging the older makers in Europe and the U.S. Two U.S. subcompacts were introduced. One, the Vega, featured an innovative four-cylinder aluminum engine, front disc brakes, and electric fuel pump. For the first time since Model T days, more four-cylinder new cars were sold than ones with six-cylinder engines. Emission control requirements caused a general lowering of horsepower in 1971 models, and much of the auto industry's research and development effort was devoted to meeting government regulations in safety and emission control areas. One of the casualties of the early 70s was the high-performance or muscle car, reflecting high insurance rates placed on it, a consumer trend to less expensive cars, and the clean air crusade. A decline in the sale of convertibles was offset by a growing popularity of the sunroof option, and all makes offered a sliding roof in either a manually or power-operated version. Side beams were installed in all cars to aid in side impact collisions, and in 1973, manufacturers added bumpers that would withstand a five mile an hour barrier crash in front and a two and a half mile per hour crash in the rear. In the years to come, the architecture of the automobile may see some radical changes. Worldwide increases in the use of energy will continue to make fuel efficiency and the conservation of all our natural resources a primary consideration in car design. Engineers and designers are finding answers in many directions. Weight reduction programs will accelerate the development and use of lighter weight materials such as aluminum and plastics and high-strength, low-alloy steels, they replace the conventional steels used in automobiles for years. New types of seating may be developed, and possibly new seating arrangements. Computers and structural analysis systems will play an important role in helping design more efficient vehicles. Electronics and the techniques of miniaturization developed in the space program may well reduce the size of electrical components and monitor and control such functions as air-fuel ratio and spark advance. These are just some of the approaches being used today to provide the efficient, safe, comfortable, personal transportation the automotive pioneers could only dream of. The search for better automotive architecture will always exist, and the consumer will continue to present new challenges to the designer and engineer. Today's automobiles are more indicative of the people and times which produce them than any other product. In some future day, they will take their place as one of the important artifacts of today's civilization.